Traumatic elbow instability. This is part two of our lecture um, from the Orthopedic Trauma Association core curriculum version four lecture series by Dr. David Ring. I'm Saka Brahman. I'm just narrating the slides. And in our first uh, video, we went really through assessment distinguished between simple and complex elbow dislocations. And now we're going to focus more on the complex uh, elbow dislocations or the so-called fracture dislocations, uh, particularly uh, radial head coronoid and then also a little bit into the proximal ulna in the last video. So here you can see posterior elbow dislocation, radial head fracture. Actually the fracture looks like it's probably right about back there. Um, so this is, you know, his, you know, so Dr. Ring goes through some slides here of a couple of uh, older papers. Um, in this early study uh, from Mayo Clinic, 24 patients um, uh, treated with radial head fracture and elbow dislocation uh, with resection. Uh, they thought these did okay, uh, although they had some secondary procedures. So um, really hard to take a whole lot of, away from that. Um, and in this particular uh, study, uh, 23 patients also treated with excision of the radial head and cast. But if you look very carefully, uh, patients had a fair amount of instability, especially with coronoid fractures. Um, and uh, resection, as we're going to get into, is something that you can consider in the absence of elbow instability. But if you think about it intuitively, if you have elbow instability and now you take away one of your stabilizers of the elbow, which is the radial head, then um, you can have persistent instability. So it's actually contraindicated. So what is the terrible triad? So by definition, the terrible triad of the elbow is a posterior elbow dislocation, radial head fracture, and a coronoid fracture. So uh, shown here, for example, you have looks like a radial head fracture. Uh, maybe a coronoid tip fracture fragment sitting over here. Uh, and on this 3D uh, recon, you can clearly see this as well. Um, so th this is a situation typically occurs with posterolateral lateral uh, rotatory instability where the lateral side fails first, and then you kind of go in this circle with the MCL failing last. And uh, this is a unfortunate um, a case it's uh, typically going to do poorly if not treated with proper op operative uh, stabilization. So just remember the coronoid, right? So patients with instability all had coronoid fractures. So here's an earlier paper by Drs. Ring and Jupiter, uh, case series 11 patients with type 2 coronoid fractures and seven redislocated re in the splinter of the cast, five redislocated after surgery. So pretty poor outcomes um, uh, treated, you know, in this in this technique. Um, so really, this treatment that we do today in 2017, I think, really is um, uh, very similar to what is in uh, this study here. Um, uh, and, and, and our Canadian colleagues, Dr. Mike McKee, Graham King, Emil Schmitz, and, and, and colleagues really helped to demonstrate what could be a very effective treatment protocol. And like I said, this is more or less what we, um, how we approach terrible triad injuries today. So it's kind of worth going through the steps. Uh, this was a case series, 30-something uh, some patients, but first step is to fix or replace the radial head, right? So not resect it. So fix or replace. All right, so that's going to be one of your steps. And in this case down here in the picture, you can see the radial head was replaced. And replacement is something that we'll do, uh, what should I say? Uh, you know, you're going to do more liberally than you may replace, for instance, a femoral head. This is not a weight-bearing joint. Uh, this is meant to be a stabilizer. Uh, it's almost like a spacer. Um, so if you have a young, active patient who has a severely comminuted radial head uh, that you simply cannot get a good reconstruction on, just don't feel bad about replacing it. As far as we know, in 2017, 
you can do that. Um, so second step was try and fix the coronoid. All right, and that can be challenging, but again, one of your stabilizers. Third thing is to repair the capsules or capsular ligamentous injuries. And here you can see uh, the lateral ulnar collateral ligament has been repaired back to the uh, lateral epicondyle with suture anchors. And then the fourth thing is consider repairing the MCL plus or minus hinge dex fix. All right, so, and I would say MCL repairs are kind of unsatisfying. A lot of surgeons opt to go with the hinged X fix or X fix instead um, in order to help um, prevent redislocation. So, again, these are kind of the steps uh, that you would consider taking um, in, in a terrible triad injury um, that uh, can give you satisfactory results. So here's a case, um, a little different now. And actually, I'll just actually come back here for one second. There really aren't a whole lot of other slides in this uh, lecture on terrible triad. Um, uh, there's another video on the OrthoClips website uh, on uh, uh, entitled Elbow Fracture Dislocations Case Presentations. It's about 30 minutes of case presentations. Uh, it's in the um, forearm and elbow um, orthotrauma playlist. Um, so if you go through that, you'll see a lot of cases of, um, or similar cases to this, and some explanation as to the thought process and, and rationale for treatment. So let's look at this case, and uh, we'll kind of explain where this falls uh, into um, as we go along. So you look at this, well, I'll give you a history that this patient dislocated, and it's important to get that history. So when you see this, you've got to find out, did the patient dislocate? Did they have to be reduced in the ED? Uh, or by somebody to physically relocate their elbow. And that's a history usually most people are not going to forget, and they can give you that information. But if you look at this, you'll see, uh, okay, it's re the elbow's reduced. It does seem to be maybe uh, some kind of coronoid fracture here. Uh, I'm drawing it bigger than what it looks to be, so I would say it doesn't really look all that big. Now, if you just look at Regan and Mori classification of coronoid fractures, um, which really looks at, um, you know, the, uh, let's just sort of draw our, oops, draw our coronoid, right? So you just sort of have a tip fracture, um, less than 50% or greater than 50%. So it kind of really just assesses the height on a lateral radiograph. So it's sort of a two-dimensional way to appreciate it. Um, and you would look at this and say, well, maybe it's a type 1, probably not type 2, um, based on that radiograph. Um, so you get an AP x-ray and you see, okay, well, something's extending over to the medial side, right? This, there's something going on here that's actually part of the coronoid as well. And you can see that um, uh, there's a fracture going on um, sort of medially there in, in the ulna. So you get a CT scan. So on a CT scan, you can confirm that your reduction certainly looks concentric. That is your ulnohumeral joint. Okay, it looks pretty good, and this looks pretty good. Uh, but you can kind of see there's that fracture that is kind of um, reflected in the lateral radiograph. And now you also see the fracture here as uh, reflected on that AP radiograph. So a 3D recon can really help to put things together for you. And here, you, now you get the impression, okay, well, there's that... There's that one fragment, and then there's a second fragment. But actually, that second fragment, it's pretty big. You can see it extends all the way down that medial side. And in fact, now you have a fluoroscopic image, so you can see there was some suspicion that uh, there's some instability here. So this is a stress view. So here you can see on a stress view, you actually have this widening here, and uh, you're sort of hint your pivoting off of this fracture on the, uh, somewhere here on the medial side, which you can't see. So what's going on here? Um, this is actually not posterolateral rotatory instability or not a posterolateral you know, um, injury mechanism like you see with the terrible triad. So a lot of times you see dislocation, coronoid fracture. You're already starting to think, OK, it's a terrible triad. Maybe the rail head's fracture or not. In this case, you can see the radial head is actually not fractured. You do have a coronoid fracture. The patient tells you they dislocated, 
and now you're getting the impression that's kind of a bigger coronoid fracture than you thought. And this is where Regan Mori classification can um, be, you know, not the most helpful. So the O'Driscoll classification um, is a little bit more helpful here because it not only takes into account these fractures at the tip or coming further down, um, but you also take into account these sort of um, more multifragmentary fractures uh, that come down onto the medial facet uh, or so-called sublime tubercle and can involve the entire base, for instance, coming down medially. So actually what's happening here in this particular patient is actually post-romedial rotatory instability. Okay, and this is where you have, um, you actually have a coronoid as shown better in this adriscal classification, anteromedial facet fracture, and then a lateral collateral ligament um, disruption here. And this is occurring from a varus force um, that, can, that can cause this. Of course, as you know, coronoid fractures can also occur with posterolateral post rotatory instability, like we saw with a terrible triad. But in this case, it's occurring from posteromedial rotatory instability from varus deforming forces. Okay, so um, you know, so this is something that uh, you can demonstrate on a stress view. You can better appreciate the fracture pattern on CT scanning, especially 3D. And you can see in this case, um, this was treated uh, through um, uh, repair of the lateral ulnar collateral. Uh, ligament here. Again, it's almost always stripped or revulsed off of the lateral epicondyle. And then the coronoid itself, in this case using a small precontoured plate, but the coronoid itself is fixed um, from a, um, here you can see likely from a medial approach uh, to come up and over onto the um, coronoid. So uh, keep in mind that you don't want to miss this type of injury. Terrible triads, you're not going to miss as easily. This is something that potentially you can miss. And before we really understood coronoid fractures really well and their role with certain instability patterns, uh, this was not fully appreciated. And here you can see in this case you can get satisfactory clinical result. Unfortunately, um, with inadequate treatment and missing these injuries, you can see uh, quite a disastrous case uh, in this particular situation where you have uh, you know residual instability here, um, significant varus, healing with malunion, um, and in this case the ulnohumeral joint is just you know persistently subluxed and um, very difficult to uh, treat. So I'm going to actually pause here and then we'll finish off this lecture in the next video uh, discussing uh, proximal ulna and olecranon fracture dislocations. Thank you.